Okay, everyone, we are back. This is Vishen Lakhiani. We are back with Helen Hatzel. This is part two of our teleseminar where we are asking Helen the biggest questions from the first 1,000 people who grabbed a hold of Helen's uh, book and DVD um, set, The Winning Sage. So let's get on with the questions, Helen. Now, Helen, how, how are you feeling today? Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, well... So let's start with the first question. Now, this question comes from Alex, and the question is as follows. Visualizing is fairly easy, but how do you deal with that part of you, that that voice in your head that says, this is pure nonsense, this is just another law of attraction, uh, a con job, it's all rubbish. I believe in Helen, I believe in the spec system, but I have these negative voices in my head. How do I silence these voices of skepticism so I can stay focused on my goal? Okay, now I'm going to say this over and over and over again. You can only think of one thing at a time. Only one thing at a time. You're in control of your thinking. If it's not positive, creative, then I would abort it and get back on track of thinking positively. Uh, you know, last last time we talked, I had uh, something that I read about, uh, watch your thoughts, they become words, watch your words, they become actions, watch your actions, they become habits, watch your habits, they become character, watch your character for it becomes your destiny. You know something, uh, when I when I said that the last time, I can say I had about 15 emails from people, all walks of life. I mean, from all over the world, really. And they said, I wrote that down, and I kept looking at it and looking at it and realizing how potential, how fantastic it is. Watch your thoughts. And said, it gave me a whole new lease on life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I repeated it again, and write it down, kid, if you didn't get it the first time. Mm -hmm. I like that. Now, here's another question, and it's it's somewhat similar. Um, Well, at least it's related, and it comes from Lynn. She said, I listened to the the first six chapters of of DVD-1, and I understand that to expect means to not have doubt that something is coming my way. But how do I relate the concept of expectancy to a specific time horizon? For example, would it be correct for me, let's say I'm trying to manifest a certain amount of money, would it be correct for me to give it a deadline, say February 28, 2009? Uh, when you do that, when you first start out, uh, I'm going to tell you, you, could, you might get disappointed because it doesn't come on that date. I I very seldom put a date on something. And when I did in the past, and it did not manifest, uh, do you know what I told myself? Okay, there's no failure. There's just a delay in my results. And then I would continue to project. And down the road it would come, but it might not come on the 28th, the day that I designated for it to come. I see. So what you're saying is, don't worry about the deadline. Just set a goal. Understand that it's going to be coming. Yes. Soon. Yes, uh-huh. Okay. But but what if it takes forever? What what if um, I mean, they 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 must be a way to reconcile this. Uh, well, you know, majority of people are impatient, and page, patience is a virtue. Just a second. So you cultivate patience. That's all. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> I get, uh, on my email, and this is humorous, uh, someone, someone orders a book, let's say, and on the email, when am I gonna get it? And when did you mail it out? And this is pace, impatience. I have no way of, uh, determining a date and an hour that she's gonna receive it. But there's still people out there that think they can do everything. It's it's impossible. You can do many, many, many things with your thoughts and your minds, but there are limitations. 
Right. Unless I, I can teleport it to you, you know. Right. I mean, one when 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 I hear a question like that, one piece of advice that does come to mind is uh, Jose Silva's advice. Um, as you know, he, he he was a great friend of yours. He had a line in his book, um, and and that that quote was, "Don't jump the gun." Basically, what he says is, start with something s- small. If your reservoir of faith is not yet strong enough, start with something small, and. Um, when that comes to you, you build up your reservoir of faith, and you can go on to something bigger, and then something bigger, and then something bigger. And you can manifest things faster, but the point is, start with something small that you believe can come to you any moment now. Don't start with something big that you think might take years for you to bring into your reality. You want to start with something small, get a small success, build up your reservoir of faith, and then keep aiming for bigger and bigger and bigger things. And that's how you can grow and, and develop this ability to manifest new outcomes very rapidly. Do you, do you, do you agree with that? Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. And I will tell you something. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you cultivate this, yes, uh, you will... I have this ability, things will come to you faster. And then you can say, so what else is new? You know, almost right. become fluent with it. But right. start out small, yes. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's go on to this, this question. And uh, this question is on illness, and it comes from Scott. Scott says, how do you avoid the negative outcome that has been presented itself as a probability? Now, what happened to Scott was he was diagnosed uh, recently with a life-threatening disease. Uh, he's wondering what he can do with spec to, say, beat the odds. Uh, you know, a number of years ago, uh, there was a book, and I, I met the man, but I don't recall the book. And he had um, uh, was working with cancer patients, and he would uh, go ahead and whatever, I mean, let's say you had a tumor or something, and you could manifest over and over and over again playing games of the good men and the bad men, and all of a sudden uh, the good men uh, winning out and, uh, and eliminating this cancer. It was very, very powerful and very popular at that time. I, I'm sure that that system still works. And whatever it is, whatever challenge we have, uh, we're needing to do something about it. And it never hurts. I mean, you're going to have uh, cons- medical consultations, et cetera, et cetera. And whatever it is, if it's negative or it's limiting, and then I would threaten it. I would say, what makes him think that I'm going to be uh, inhabilitated? What makes him think? I refuse to be that way. So there you're canceling that out already. And uh, I'm not saying uh, that doctors aren't doing uh, a great job. They are. But you're in control of your body, kid. It's your decision. What do you, where do you want to go from here? And I've seen miracles, absolute miracles performed in an attitude and it's difficult when you get negative, 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 because you're working here to eliminate all that. Be a miracle. Helen, Change the odds. Yes. Did 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 you ever get a chance to meet um, Doctor O. Carl Simonton? Yes, Carl. Yes, Carl. Yes, that's who I was referring to. Yes, he lived in Fort Worth. Uh, he and his wife, uh, yes, came to Jose, met Jose. Yes, yes. I was just going to say, for, for, for people listening, people like Scott, who might be facing a life-threatening disease, um, O. Carl Simonton is a doctor who came up with something called imagery therapy for cancer. What he did was he found that he could teach cancer patients who had this obviously life, serious life-threatening disease. He, could, he would teach them specific visualization exercises, and they would beat the odds. They would go into what is called spontaneous remission. The cancer would disappear, and they would go on to live long, healthy lives. Now, it didn't happen for all patients, but it happened for a significantly large number of them. Now, uh, O. Carl Simonton was a big fan of Silva. In fact, his wife, uh, him and his wife uh, spoke at one of the Silva conventions. Uh, I was not there. I was probably a kid at that time, but, but Helen, I, I think you may have been there. One of the things they said is that Silva is one of the most powerful tools they've come um, 
in terms of they've, they've come across in terms of imagery therapy. So my advice to people like Scott is uh, look up the works of O. Carl Simonton. Um, you can Google that. It's O space Carl C A R L space Simonton S I M O N T O N. Uh, and also look into the uh, the Silva Light System. Um, uh, which also talks about imagery therapy. Helen, do you, do, do you have any stories about Carl or anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I was very, very impressed with his, uh, with, with his work, uh, and I know it's possible, definitely possible. And I'm always one that has to prove something to myself. And so I did research. And one of the things that we did, I was up in New York, and uh, one of the gals that was a secretary had a challenge uh, when she had back surgery, hurt her back, and then one of her feet was about two inches shorter than the other foot. And when we got there, I said, "Why don't we? Uh, why don't we uh, go ahead and practice what we what we're teaching?" And they all agreed. This was at one of the seminars in New York. And all of us, all of us, there were about a hundred so and so, uh, decided that we were going to uh, think about her every night and stretch her foot so it would become even with her other because this was an inch and a half shorter. We worked with that and worked with that and thought it was a game really. But the outcome, and this is gospel, the outcome was that it was eventually it it seemed to be pulling it and she could actually feel the pulling of it and now it's normal she walks normal not not by what sideways as she once did and this is a factual case so yes everything is possible but we now we had a hundred people working with that and i said that was our research project and and there's another one. Laura Huxley has the book, You Are Not the Target. And in that, she has some good material also. And that was, uh, uh, you know, when something happens, uh, what is it? There's another book, Bad Things Happen to Good People. Uh, well, she um, gives some good histories about you are not the target. Nobody's picking on you. Uh, you've done this, and you hate to admit that somewhere along the line you did it to yourself. But let's face reality and facts. If you did, if you have done this, you can undo it. But I loved her book. I recommend it very highly. Great. Well, let's go on to 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 uh, a question in a different theme, and uh, this question actually comes all the way from from Malaysia, from uh, uh, Chuan Po. And what Chuan Po is asking is, I've always dreamed about visiting Europe, but I don't have the money to actually fly from Asia uh, to Europe because I come from a small Southeast Asian country. I would love to see the Mediterranean and, and bask in the splendor and pomp during spring. What specific advice would I do? How would I specifically a apply the spec system to help me realize this dream of vacationing in the Mediterranean. Oh well, there it's easy. You've got you have your picture here, and you already are there, seeing yourself as being there. So if there's a contest or an opportunity, and I don't know if there are contests in your area, I certainly would uh, pursue that as a contest. But I also would see myself as being there, but uh, the contest would be one of the means of getting there. But don't don't let go of that dream if it's that important to you. You'll be there basking in the sun and enjoying it. You'll be there. Now, now, in, a, now in a situation like this, Helen, where, where someone like Chuan Po, um, obviously he has this dream, but he doesn't have the finances to get there. Uh, can you give us some examples of how things might manifest for him? I mean, from your life, because I know you've won. How many trips to Europe have you won? I, I, I don't recall because my son's also won trips. Okay. But so all together, yes, five, six or whatever. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. But how might things manifest for someone like Chuan Po? I mean, obviously, he, he may not have the money for it. 
Okay, <clears throat> we talked about this earlier. I said, see yourself as already being there. Continuously see yourself as already being there. Read about the material. Uh, just actually, it's a visualization and it's a desire and it's so, so strong. You never know what happens. And I'm sure you're still young. So you've got this whole life ahead of you. And uh, who, you're you're going to be there, kid. You're going to be there, and just see yourself as already being there. That important to you? Hang on to it. That's a dream. That's a good dream. Great. Great. Now this question comes from uh, Annette, and uh, the question is: So let's say I want to win a particular contest. How many times should I? Enter. If I don't win the first time, do I keep entering? How does that process work? Uh, well, remember, in the contesting, there are so many, many, many contests. And if you enter something, and in my book I explain this, if I didn't win from one person or one uh, particular contest, I keep entering the ones that are giving that prize until... I win the prize, and that's it. These are opportunities. And uh, remember when I talked about the contest queen, and she has this book out that uh, uh, that uh, there are contest uh, clubs all over the world. And if you're really serious about entering contests to win prizes, I would highly recommend you visit one of these clubs. And sit there and maybe become a member. There's, uh, it's just a desire is all they're doing, but they're very, very, very successful. I was amazed when I went to the one here in Dallas a month or two ago when Caroline came from, uh, 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 from Canada to visit me. And so she has a book out that tells you, uh, every place that there is a a club meeting. So that would be my answer for you. I see. So you really you 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 really do think joining a contesting club is a, is a very important step. Yeah, uh uh-huh. people with like interests. Well, of course. Uh, they they have all the information, they have the encouragement. It's a fun fun thing, you know. For years, when I first started, I entered. I was a member of a club, and I, it was very, very successful and rewarding because we were encouraging. We were saying, "Oh, you want a trip? Well, did you hear about this trip? Oh, you want gas? Did you hear this? Did you hear this? Did you hear this?" And you can't hear everything, but somebody's always on their toes and encouraging you and helping you, and you in turn do the same thing. That's initially how I won my house, because when I got back uh, from uh, uh, Europe and I went to the contest club and one of the gals said, oh, did you, uh, when you were in New York, did you see the World's Fair house? And I said, no, I was so busy. Uh, my son had won a trip there and I, I was so excited to get to Paris, France for my birthday. I, I don't even know there was a contest for a house. Oh, yes, for Micah's giving this house away. And uh, she says, locally, you can enter it, and uh, you can go to Garland and put your name in the pot. And that's what I did. So this was, I mean, I didn't have the information. It came to me because I, the con, one of the contest members uh, clued me in about it. So if you're serious, uh, definitely pursue it. How serious are you? It's up to you. Well, perfect. And you know what, Helen? You just answered uh, in advance the question I was about to ask. This came from someone in Southern California called the Cosmic Coach, and she said she and a group of spirited souls in Southern California are looking to start a contesting club. Where can they get advice on this? And and, and you just answered it. The, the, the answer is look up um, the book by the Carolyn. Contest Queen. Yes, Carolyn uh-huh. Wilman, The Contest Queen. And her website is contestqueen.com, and uh, you can get information from there. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, well, let, let's go on to uh, uh, the next question. And right now we're moving more towards questions on contesting. 
And this question comes all the way from Gabriella uh, in Denmark. Um, her question is, the landscape has changed and uh, now there are a lot of competitions and sweepstakes and a lot of on the internet. Um, is your advice the same? Does anything change uh, to, to take advantage of the way contesting has changed over the last five years? Oh, definitely uh, it has changed. You know, at one time it was, uh, uh, you had to write 25 words or less. This was a contest. Now there's sweepstakes. And sweepstakes, you know, you can enter uh, simply on the Internet. Uh, and there is a method, and I'm not familiar with it, because I'm really not interested in material things anymore. You know, I'm jaded. I outgrew all that. But a lot, a lot of these young, enthusiastic uh, people that are needing and wanting these things, they're available to you. Uh, there's a method. And Carolyn, can, uh, she, when she came here, she showed it to me. Instead of entering your name one time and then going and entering it again and again, uh, and it's, it's time-consuming, she has this little technique where you can uh, enter, I'd say, about... 40 or 50 contests that are now going on in about 15, 20 minutes. I, I sat here absolutely amazed how efficient and effective you can uh, get on the email and enter these contests that are available. And yes, prizes are always won. Uh, they're legitimate and they're serving a purpose because they're, uh, what they're, they're promoting their products. And so uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful way to get a lot of little stuff. And I repeated this last time, and I will repeat it again, uh, when I visited the group that were in the Dallas contest that met in Irving. This was in November. And they stood up, and it was not uncommon for them to say nine or ten prizes in one month. And they all sounded lucrative because at that time gas was uh, outrageous in price, and somehow they they kept winning gas, and I just sat there and kind of laughed, and thought, God, I'd lo well, I wouldn't get into it anymore because I have other interests now, but if that's your main interest, then go for it, kid, go for it. Now, now I know uh, a bunch of people are asking, well, Helen's now saying that she has other interests. What are her other interests? I, I thought we should segue for a moment here, Helen. I, I wanted to share with the audience one of the things you shared with me uh, about how you're now giving away a lot of the uh, the profits you make from your blueprints and such to uh, to a Feed the Children charity. Could you, could you say a little bit about that? Well, uh, there's a place in Fort Worth that uh, uh, feeds the homeless. And, of course, I think now it's a dollar a meal or something like that. That's my pet charity right now. It changes. Last year it was to buy glasses, uh, you know, uh, for children that were not able, and this was Lions Club. And so it changes uh, throughout the years. I know when my husband and I were here together, we would go to Dallas and get shoes for everybody. Uh, there was a, uh, a man that owned a shoe store, and we would generously donate uh, when he went around to, find, uh, to get, you know, to put shoes on people. So everything is different. And then uh, locally here in the college, um, I mean in the high school, uh, I have some friends there that teach. And if they come and say somebody needs a, a, a suit to graduate and, or whatever, I just simply, this is what I do. It's not on one one big thing. It's on little things. And I'm drawn to it. Uh, yes, I get a lot of emails. Uh, my husband has cancer. My daughter has this. So-and-so has this and so forth. And it goes on and on and on. And I read the, and I read the uh, emails. But they're so depressing and so negative. And well, before I turn the email off, I uh, I can't answer them all, really, because they're just overwhelming. But believe me, I send love and energy to every one of them, because that's all I can do. I mean, you can't pick and start out uh, one thing at a time. I choose where I want to uh, put the, put my money. 
Does that answer your question? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, okay. now, now I, I have my opinion on this, but I'm, I'm curious to know what, what you think. Is giving away the charity or, or helping a worthy cause, uh, does that in any way help speed up the rate at which you manifest things and desires for yourself? And if so, why? Well, the only thing that I have found, and that is I feel good about to being able to do that. It's a feeling of, uh, of well, satisfaction and uh, that I did something to help somebody else. That's my reward. I don't think of another reward. I have an uncle, I mean, I have a brother-in-law in uh, Austin that does this, uh, goes every morning to the um, grocery stores, bakeries and things, gets all the baked goods and puts it. Now, this guy is 84 years old. Every morning at 4 o'clock, gets up and gets all this bakery goods and puts it in his truck and goes from soup kitchen to church that has open meetings to feed the poor in the parish, goes there every solitary morning and gives this uh, this uh, uh, bread and rolls and stuff. And what is his reward? He t- I talked to him. And uh, he said, uh, it makes me feel good. And he said, you know something, it's Sunday in church. I'm walking out of church, and a man comes up to me and gives me a $100 bill and says, listen, you need gas money for what you're doing, and use this for your gas money. And he said, I just was overwhelmed that someone would think about, he said, it doesn't worry, my gas doesn't worry, but it evidently made this man feel good, and so that's my gas money. And so uh, this is something beautiful that this man has done for the last 15 years. That's a very beautiful story, and uh, uh, I, I completely agree. My, my take on it is when you're giving to someone else or giving to a charitable cause, uh, what, tends to, what tends to happen is that you tend to put yourself in a frame of mind where you feel abundance, because, of course, to give something away, you must already have it. So you put yourself in a frame of mind where you feel abundance and therefore you allow more abundance to flow to you. Yes. Uh-huh. So I've, I've noticed that, that, in, that in, in my case as well, uh, what we've started doing uh, with our web businesses, uh, and here I'm talking about Finer Minds, our personal development blog, what we've started doing is giving a lot of uh, uh, money away. Uh, right now, the cause that we are supporting is Burmese refugees in Southeast Asia. Uh, a lot of these people uh, go through really, really, really tough times, almost slavery, uh, and we are, are funding non-profits that help with education and, and, and services to help these people um, emigrate, uh, emigrate as refugees to, to the United States. Well, see, I'm not a, a financier, so my, my, uh, my contributions are more personalized and smaller than the big grandiose, right. you know, the ones right. that I have making lots of money. But I'm, I, I'm just picking and choosing what I feel uh, is uh, important. Uh, I, don't, I can't uh, really explain it, but it's a good feeling. I'm working on something now that may sound uh, mundane or whatever, but I, I've heard now that someone is needing a, a stove. And what I'm doing is uh, seeing that she gets the stove. I mean, you know, these these are little things around the neighborhood. Don't have to go to Africa or Indonesia or whatever uh, to do anything. Mm-hmm. How about locally doing things for the good? Absolutely. And that's where I'm at. Absolutely. Okay, now l- let, let's go on to... Um to the next question and uh, this question is is by Ruth and it's on the topic of expectancy so Ruth asks what does the feeling of expectancy with certainty feel like I understand the spec process but I seem to get bogged down with the final uh, uh, part of it um, E which is expectancy I feel like I'm always second guessing the outcome or looking for it in some way at a particular time 
How can you know when you have something that you've selected and projected? How do you know that that is about to arrive? How do you let go of it and relax and simply expect it? Again, that's a feeling, honey. I mean, I just, uh, let's say I'm in the kitchen doing dishes, and the thought comes to my mind, and to expect is knowing that it's already done. Or just like, when are they going to let us know that I won this? When are they going to let us know this or whatever it is? It's when are they going to let us know feeling? It's already done. I've already given it enough energy. Now all I'm waiting for is to let them know, let me know that I want it. So it's a feeling. And when you get that feeling and then it doesn't happen, then keep on getting that feeling until it does manifest and then go on to something else. Mm-hmm. The... Um the, the, the idea of expectancy also reminds me of a, 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 a lot of what Jose Silva talks about in, uh, in the Silva method. They talk about um, desire, belief, and expectancy, the three attitudes that help create success. And um, one of the things that, that, that Jose Silva talks about is, again, start with something small, something believable. Don't jump the gun. Something that you believe can happen to you and you expect it to happen because you know it's very achievable. Uh, as soon as that happens, you build up your reservoir of faith and you can aim for higher and higher and higher things. But that's how you gradually build up your expectancy. Uh, but, but if I may, Helen, I, I, I just want to share a, a, a short anecdote uh, that might help someone like Ruth understand uh, what the feeling of expectancy is like. So here's, uh, he, here's an example. Let's say a, a good friend of yours um, asks you to lend him some money and you lend this person money and um, he promises to pay you back but a month goes by and he hasn't paid you back the thousand dollars he owes you now you're obviously frustrated you're upset you're wondering what the the, the, the hell has this guy done to me he's taken advantage of our friendship um, now you are obviously upset you are not expecting the money to come back come to you and that's why you have a feeling of frustration but let's say all of a sudden your friend calls you up and says, hey, Ruth, I just had a change of heart and I decided that what I did was a really, really, really awful thing. And I realized that I want to pay you back the money immediately. So I am FedExing you a check. And um, here's the FedEx number. And I'm also going to fax you a copy of the check. And I'm going to fax you the FedEx uh, delivery receipt so you can you can track it online. Um, And you'll be getting it in the next 48 hours. Now, of course, Ruth has not received the check yet. The check has not gone to a bank. She does not have the money. But all of a sudden, she's feeling joyful because she expects it to come. In other words, she knows the check is in the mail. So it's really that feeling that we are aiming for, the feeling where you are so certain, you you so expect what you are seeking to come to you because you know the check is in the mail. And that is what we mean by expectancy. So that's the feeling you want to cultivate. Now, of course, it's not easy. It takes some practice. So you want to start with small goals and slowly build this up. But eventually you get to a stage where you're getting so many successes that whatever you set your mind on, you expect it to happen. And so it happens. Esther Hicks has a nice quote. She says, um, there's a scale of emotions you want to feel. Uh, Hope is easier than doubt. Sorry, hope is better than doubt. Expectancy is better than hope. Expectancy is the ultimate emotion. But you start with doubt. You gradually move that doubt into hope when you have a few successes. And once you're really nailing it, you move from hope to expectancy. So I I just thought I'd jump in with that there. Helen, anything to add? Yes, that's excellent. Uh, When I And this happened a number of years ago. And uh, there was a, a group of people that invited me to come and ask. Uh, so I, I gave them four hundred dollars worth of books, and they were in dire need. This was just an, another uh, group of people that were sincere and in, uh, trying to raise the consciousness of people, but uh, they never paid that four hundred and twenty-five dollars. So I came, and he said he was going to mail me this check, and uh, he never did. Never mailed it. So at the end of the year, my husband said, uh, well, let's write it off as a bad debt, and that's that's what we'll do. I said, no. He he told me he would pay it, and he owes it to me, and it's rightfully mine. And would you believe that in my office, 
I had this note, and I said, Glenn, uh, in his last name, owes me this $425 because he said he would pay it, and he owes it to me. So the next year, the next year, it's time again. Uh, and my husband says, well, let's write it off. And I said, no, 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 he owes this to me. <laughs> and uh, I am intimate. And do you know, the third year, there's a knock on my door, and there stands Glenn, smiling, and he said, you know, I keep thinking about you, and I still owe you this money. And he said, with interest now, is $500. And he walked in, and I gave him coffee, and that was the end of it. He was on traveling around the country, but I got the money. Three years, but he owed it to me. Now, can you explain that? I don't know. All I know is he telepathically evidently got my message because this was something he owed. I didn't give it to him. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Helen, at, at this point, we're at the end of the uh, the second teleseminar. And um, so do you have any final words of wisdom to wrap up? Yes, I do. I want people to know that there are three things that make life worthwhile. And that is to feel useful by doing something, to be loved by someone, and to have something to look forward to. And those are my three words of wisdom today. <laughs> and uh, what what are you looking forward to in 2009? Uh, well, gosh, you know, I'm so fortunate here. I am so very, very, very fortunate that for some reason I am still wanting to be with, uh, on the on the uh, Letterman show. Why do I want to be on this stupid Letterman show? I really don't know until I get there. But that's a goal. That's a goal here. And so we're going to see about that. Yeah, it's going to be a... And I'm, 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 I am excited and waiting to see that happen. I, I am really in true. I, I am too, really. I'm giving it lots and lots of energy because I see myself sitting there beside the idiot and we're talking, you know. He's not, uh, well, what's uh, what, something that uh, comes to mind? Why do I want to see him? Well, he's a skeptic, number one. I'm not trying to prove anything to him. But anyway, that's, a, that's what I want to do, and I'll talk about it further later on, why it's so important to me. Right. Okay. Well, good luck with that, and, I'm looking, and, uh, and I wish you all the best for 2009. And uh, to everyone listening in, I wish you all the best as well, and I hope you enjoy, you enjoy the teleseminar. Thank you, everyone.